Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you can join us. Uh, my name is Bethany Yeiser. I'm president of the CURES Foundation. CURES stands for Comprehensive Understanding via Research and Education to Schizophrenia. And we're very happy to hold this lecture series tonight. Tonight, our special guest is Dr. William Rush. Dr. William Rush is a practicing psychiatrist at Ohio, Ohio Health Riverside Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He is an appointed assistant professor of psychology at the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. He's a distinguished fellow of the APA. He's a board certified by both the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and the American College of Osteopathic Neurology and Psychiatry. And he has additional training and certification in transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. So Dr. Rush, welcome, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for that nice introduction, Bethany. It's great to be here tonight and talking with your group, and thank you for everyone's attendance. So um, once again, I'm Bill Rush, and I do work at the Ohio Health um, Hospital System in Columbus, Ohio. I'm an outpatient psychiatrist, also work in the medical education department training uh, psychiatry residents. So a couple months ago, I uh, sent Bethany a list of topics, and I think she uh, had people vote on them, and this was the one that received the most votes, and uh, sleep hygiene and managing fatigue. And it kind of makes sense because this is such a ubiquitous concern for many people. So not surprised, and I'm glad to be speaking on it tonight because I think it's uh, two very high yield topics and hopefully you get a lot out of it. I purposely tried to make it pretty practical so you could potentially implement some of the things we'll talk about tonight um, or tomorrow uh, pretty soon. So just briefly, we're gonna look at some history, which I find important. Uh, sometimes some statistics, definitions and recommendations for both sleep, sleep hygiene and managing fatigue. We wanna be more aware of how and why to improve sleep quality and sleep hygiene for how important it is, and then try to get a better appreciation, understanding, awareness of managing uh, fatigue. And like I said, I, I think these are really interesting topics. I hope you do too. And again, high yield that they can impact every single one of us on this call on a daily or nightly basis. Nothing really to disclose at this time. Um, and I was prepping this lecture and thinking, what is sleep like? And I thought about that a little bit, and I kind of think or view sleep as somewhat of an ocean or like the oceans. You know, our earth is the majority water and, you know, two thirds water. And we still find a lot of mystery and take the oceans for granted and oftentimes neglect the oceans, unfortunately, with you know, pollution, trash, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of our lives, a third or more of our lives are spent sleeping. And I think myself included over the years have somewhat neglected sleep, abused sleep, not given it the importance that it should have in our lives. So that's one reason why I kind of view it as the ocean. Also, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. So I kind of grew up watching this amazing person, Jacques Cousteau and the Calypso Society. And, you know, he, with his aqua lung and his submarines, he kind of opened our eyes up to beneath the surface of the ocean to the silent world, said there were a lot of secrets held within our water planet. And there was a little bit of a mystery to it still to this day for as important as the oceans are. So that's kind of where I lead into even sleep is a little bit of a mystery to all of us and to science. This age-old question that researchers have been asking since the beginning of time, why do we sleep? And we have theories, but we don't exactly know all the answers right now. There's still a lot of unanswered questions to sleep, as you'll see. As I mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist, much like Lucy Van Pelt in the uh, Peanuts cartoon. And again, I think, I'm a psychiatrist, see a lot of patients, a lot of different disorders, a lot of different symptoms. But if I could give one thing like this old crusty curly boss in the pretty popular movie back in the day called City Slickers, he used to kind of tease Billy Crystal and say that one thing in life that 
and I, if I could give one thing to all my patients, that one thing would be better sleep because it's so important. Better sleep um, just kind of is the tide that rises all ships, no matter if you have schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, PTSD, et cetera. And who on this call can't relate to the restorative power of a good night's sleep? And if you don't want to kind of think scientifically, I'm a big sports fan. So Tom Brady, he's considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. He exceeded all expectations as quarterback. Um, I think he played for 23 seasons, retired at 45. He has very strict training methods. And one of his core training methods is sleep. It's part of his TB12 method. And he credits it for having such a successful career. Similarly, on the basketball court, LeBron James is also uh, a big proponent of sleep. He says sleep is uh, one of the most um, important tools he uses to recover as a professional athlete. He sleeps about 12 hours a day, nine hours a night, and then two to three hours at naps. So that's LeBron James and Tom Brady. Outside of the sports world, Warren Buffett is on record of being a bit of a night owl, but he tries to get eight hours every night. And he's got a famous quote, you want to try to uh, find an income stream where you can make money sleeping. Um, Bill Gates is another one that's on record with the PBS um, News Hour, I believe. He indicated that at one time he oftentimes neglected his sleep until he found how important it was to him. And he is very um, adamant of also getting a certain number of hours per sleep. And finally, when kind of leading into this importance, I came across this really amazing picture of a man sleeping underneath the tree there in the white. So Bethany, you're the only person I can see. Do you know who that one person is? Believe it or not, that is the Thomas Edison, the inventor, you know, the um, inventor that he is. And the person that's waiting on him with the paper, that is the current president in 1921, Warren G. Harding of Marion, Ohio. And then the, the guy next to him is Harvey Firestone, the founder and famous businessman of the Firestone Rubber and Tire Company. So they had some meeting and Thomas Edison uh, felt so inclined to take a nap because it was important to him and his health and well-being. And into the corporate world, you go to like Silicon Valley and Google and Facebook, they have these nap rooms um, with these napping pods in them, they encourage their employees to get sleep throughout the day when they need it to increase work productivity, creativity, imagination, vision, and it creates a healthier workforce, less burnout. So even they know the importance of sleep. And I like to tell patients all the time, better sleep for a better you. There's a commercial these days. I'm not even sure what it's selling, but Jennifer Aniston is in it, and she says a good day starts with a good night. And sometimes I'll tell patients it's never too late to start sleeping better, and that includes this audience, and that's why I'm going to kind of talk about some practical um, things you can do to hopefully improve your sleep. And we have all probably heard about the three pillars of health. Those three would be nutrition, exercise, and again, I I impartial sleep as a psychiatrist i put sleep in the middle they say you should treat all three of these kind of equally but again in my humble opinion i put sleep kind of at the foundation because i think if you have a better sleep foundation it makes the other two things that much easier to do um plus it's the easiest of all three because you don't need anything you don't need food you don't need a machine you don't need a gym you can just sleep if you've got the time. And so it acts as a little bit of a catalyst for the other two. So I think sleep's really important. And how about this amazing quote from really the um, most eminent pioneer researcher in the field, Dr. Uh, Rechshoffen, who's out of Northwestern. He said, if sleep does not serve an absolute vital function, then it's the biggest mistake in the evolutionary process. That's, you know, saying how important it is. And this uh, researcher was really the pioneer in finding how important sleep is, uh, studies on insomnia, studies on narcolepsy, studies on sleep apnea, and studies on napping. 
he, along with a man by the name of William DeMint, are two of the kind of the fathers of modern day sleep medicine. So a little bit of history, um, going back to our Neanderthal ancestors. Um, prior to 70,000 BC, uh, the primates would sleep in chunks called polyphasic sleep. So you'd get an hour here, an hour there, all throughout the day. And it was in this time frame when that shifted. And we went from polyphasic to monophasic, where we had a big chunk of time uh, at night. And that started here. So I view this change and why we sleep at night for a certain number of hours as part of the evolutionary process. And despite the you know, many, many years of evolution, it's still a big challenge for a lot of us, including a person on the call we were talking with earlier said, I have a big problem with sleep. Moving forward a little bit, but still B BC times, uh, in ancient civilizations like India, Egypt, China, they also documented problems with sleep. They used chanting to help with sleep. They used divination, which is bringing the spiritual world into it. They would bloodlet seemed like they would do that for pretty much everything at the time. And they use medicinal plants like chamomile and things like that to try to sleep better. And then, again, this block of time called monophasia was given new importance in the 12th century with this pretty famous um, person in medicine, philosopher, physician, rabbi, uh, Maimonides, who argued that a single night's sleep of about eight hours was sufficient for humans. That's where we oftentimes hear this eight hour. And he actually, to his credit, was in the range that I'm going to show you, which is currently accepted as the best range. Um, it's not exactly eight hours on the button, but he's in the ballpark, as you'll see. Um, and he's also famous, just a fun fact, a little trivia. He's also famous for the um, discovery that chicken noodle soup is good for upper respiratory infections in colds. And that was in the 12th century, which was still proven out later on in history. Moving forward to the um, 1700s, a researcher by the name of Demarin was working with plants and he started to be intrigued by this um, pattern that they go through where they'd open their leaves during the day and then close at night. And he's like, that's unique. So he put them in dark for days at a time. And he realized that same pattern happened, the opening and closing of leaves on a regular rhythmic pattern. So he called that circadian, meaning around the day, um, circadian rhythm. And that was in a plant. So then human researchers wanted to say, do we have the same circadian rhythm as plants? So these researchers, Kleitman and Richardson, uh, went deep into the mammoth cave of uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and tried to shift their rhythm off that 24-hour cycle that we're used to. And the results were a little inconclusive, but it, it pointed to the fact that we probably do have the same 24-hour circadian rhythm internal clock as do plants. And that was definitively confirmed in a more um, a better designed study in the 50s by Ashoff, who actually with the aid and funding of NATO, put used human research subjects in, instead of plants in a bunker there, no uh, sun, no light, and found that definitively we have a 24 hour internal clock circadian rhythm, much like the plants. And they're not dependent really on sunlight or darkness, it's just part of our internal clock. And then in the 70s, that was uh, furthered along with um, some research on fruit, fruit flies and uh, genetic components were identified. But this circadian rhythm research is still ongoing. Just seven years ago, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to three individuals who uh, furthered the research with molecular mechanisms um, behind circadian rhythm. So this is still an active area of research and going back to the fact that there's still a lot of unanswered questions in sleep medicine that we're going to continue to work on, continue to find out in the years ahead. So as far as some statistics, like I said, this is a good topic because it affects so many people and it's just not an American concern. It's a worldwide concern. Over two thirds of adults around the world say they don't sleep as well as they like. Their quality is off. 
Similarly, similar number uh, say they're disturbed at least once a night, which leads to you know further sleep problems. And as far as mental health concerns, when you have a mental health concern, look how your sleep across the board kind of drops below that magical number of seven that we're trying to achieve, um, including the um, subject of this group here, the disorder schizophrenia, uh, falls below that seven hour mark that we hope for. So sleep can be an issue in schizophrenia, is an issue in schizophrenia. Interesting in this study, it was more problematic and slightly more problematic in the male population than the female population. So like I said, Maimonides kind of came up with that eight hour rule of thumb, but now experts general consensus in the field of American Academy of Sleep Medicine and Sleep Research Society uh, say we need about seven to nine hours of sleep per night. That's our target goal for optimal sleep. And the exact time, whether it be seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, can be, um, can be uh, very individualized from person to person, depending on the age of that person, which we talked about a little bit ago, as well as genetic characteristics, which we'll also talk about. So here's the part about the age. And interestingly, as we age, we need less sleep. It makes sense that a if anybody's been around a baby, they sleep a lot. And part of that is for neurodevelopmental reasons. They need a lot of um, development in their brains. And then as they age, you can kind of see you get less and less to the biggest age group here. A lot of us on the call will be in this seven to nine hours. I'm sure there's people in this call that's older and you actually need less sleep for reasons we don't exactly know than the seven to nine, it goes to seven to eight. So age plays a big factor in the amount of hours you need to sleep, which is kind of interesting. And a lot of people, when they think about sleep, they try to, they just land on a number and that's nice, seven, eight, nine hours. Undoubted, undoubtedly that's important, but it's not the only part of the equation. It's also important to consider the sleep quality or what we call the architecture of how that sleep is put together and how restorative it is as a bodily function. And that includes phases or stages of sleep that make up a sleep cycle. And a sleep cycle is gonna be three, four total sleep stage, three non-REM sleep stages, which we're gonna see here in a little bit, and one rapid eye movement, REM, stage that makes a sleep cycle and the best sleep consists of four to six sleep cycles per night kind of sequentially and the duration again is variable from person to person on average a full entire sleep cycle which we'll see in a second is about 90 minutes so the stages of sleep allow the brain to recover both uh, itself our physical body, our mental body, as we'll see, and support other bodily functions, whether it be endocrine, hormone, muscle, musculoskeletal, etc. And the more we sleep and work on our sleep hygiene, the better it helps facilitate the proper sequencing of stages and sleep cycle. So let's break down these important stages that make up our sleep architecture. The first stage no big surprise, it's called light sleep as we enter into sleep from awakeness to light sleep. And that consists of stage one, which is very brief, going into stage two, but both light sleeps. No rapid eye movement in either of these stages. This is where our muscles relax and we, we prepare ourselves and our body for sleep. As well as our body temperature drops, our breathing drops, our heart rate drops to prep for deeper sleep. And about 50% of our total sleep and sleep cycle is in this stage one and two. And this is really important for memory consolidation. So hopefully after this talk, you're gonna have some sleep spindles tonight to kind of uh, ram everything home. And, or if you study hard, you're gonna have more sleep spindles if we were to test you on an EEG machine. You actually can see visibly these concentrations of electrical activity where the brain is consolidating that memory. 
So it's really important to have these stages of sleep in the proper duration and order. And as you can imagine, if you're going to wake up, it's going to be easier to wake up in a light sleep stage like this than it is in three and four, which we'll see. So stage one and two um, move into stage three. And this is called deep sleep, still no rapid eye movement. And this is critical for restorative physical sleep. This is muscle growth and repair. So we tear down our muscle during the day through exercise or just normal, and then we build it back up through this phase of sleep. It also flushes the um, brain and the central nervous system of toxins and waste products that uh, happen through just normal metabolic activity throughout the day. And we've probably all heard of the lymphatic system, which kind of cleans our bodies. But only about 12 years ago, we discovered a specific designated lymphatic cleaning system for the brain or central nervous system called the glymphatic system. And again, if I pulled people off the street, I don't know if many people would have heard of this. Again, back to the analogy between the ocean and sleep. A lot of us don't know a lot about sleep. And it cleans the, um, cleans the brain of toxins, as you can see here, and helps, um, you know, push it into the bigger, larger lymphatic system and then uh, excrete it out the body. And typically this deep sleep is really important. It happens in the first couple hours in the early stages of sleep. And this is about all told about a quarter of the sleep cycle, a quarter of your night of sleep. And this is a harder sleep stage to wake up from. If you try to wake somebody up, they're going to have a harder time waking up for the, for the reason it's deeper and uh, just harder to wake up from. Finally, stage four is finally that REM sleep, standing for rapid eye movement. And if you watch somebody's eyes, you can actually see them underneath the eyelids moving back and forth, oscillating. Or if you literally open the eye, you'll see it. Or if you have a, you know, a EMG machine on the muscles, you'll see the muscles just flipping back and forth. And this is where um, brain activity actually picks up now from it slowing down in one through three. It picks up, our respers pick back up, our heart rate picks back up. We start to dream. This is where you have dreams. We don't want to act out our dreams. So we become a you know immobile with atonia or lack of muscle function, with two exceptions, the eyes and the diaphragm to keep you breathing. And this is a really important uh, piece of sleep that helps with emotional conflict and struggles. It's almost like an internal therapy that we kind of work through some of that stuff in our sleep, believe it or not. And that's why sometimes your emotions and conflicts turn into dreams. Yeah, but this is, you know, where I said stage three deep sleep was important for physical recovery. This is really important for mental recovery, as you can see. This is essential to really higher level cognitive functions. So insight, insightful thinking, creativity, and further memory consolidation. And this is about another quarter of your sleep cycle and total sleep. And then potentially you wake up, and that's kind of another reason why you start to pick up your bodily function. So here's a graphical representation of what we uh, just went over. The short N1 stage going into N2, making up about 50% of your uh, light sleep, and then about a quarter of deep sleep for physical restoration, then a quarter of vivid dreaming, REM for the mental restoration. And that is a full sleep cycle, average 90 minutes, and you want somewhere between 40 or four to six of these a night. So this is it broken down in a chart, which is a little harder to read. The other thing is if you were to undergo a sleep study or you have a um, smartwatch or something else measuring it, you can actually see your sleep architecture through a, a graph called a hypnogram. So it's essentially hypno means sleep, so a sleep gram. And this is actually somebody's sleep cycle as it's graphed out on this chart, monitoring brain activity. And you see the drop down into stage one, stage two, stage three, and then the red is REM, that's one cycle. Then the second cycle, third, fourth, fifth. So this is five cycles, not too bad. Uh, with a few awakenings, which is somewhat normal. So that's really important, and it kind of just reinforces what I said earlier. A number is nice, but this is more 
architecture and how what's the quality of sleep you want to make sure you have those stages and those cycles occurring to uh, improve your overall sleep quality so we talked about age being an important part making sure you get enough sleep cycles genetics plays a role too what we call chronotype and this is we're born with this uh we're given genes that either make us an early bird a night owl or what they call a hybrid version called a third bird. And the more we can kind of sync up our good sleep patterns with these chronotypes or genetic things, the better quality sleep we'll get. So it's nice to be able to synchronize and optimize your sleep to match this. So I myself tend to be a third bird. So I do best going to bed about 10 or 11. I could go to sleep at nine, but it wouldn't be as great as if I timed it up with my natural uh, genetic clock. So it's important to kind of know and figure out and then kind of adjust your sleep accordingly to what your chronotype is. So that's an important thing that sometimes gets missed too. So here's another thing, you know, people talk about melatonin being the most important neurotransmitter sleep for sleep. And it is, I'm not saying it's not important, but the most important neurotransmitter for sleep is that of adenosine. And as you can see here, it promotes sleep drive and a person's need to sleep. So throughout the day, your adenosine is building, 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 and the more it accumulates, the more sleep you get and sleep pressure, and then that goes right into sleep. And that is synced up with your circadian rhythm, that internal clock in our suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that happens every day, like a cycle you'll see here in a second with a graph. If you don't have enough adenosine building up through the day or it's disrupted, you're not going to sleep as well. You're not going to induce the sleep like you would if you had enough adenosine present. And deep sleep, the type, the stage three, the stage four that we want, is prolonged and enhanced by adequate levels of adenosine. Adenosine is not contained in any sleep aids. People are like, well, just give me, give me adenosine. And it's not that easy. If you give artificial adenosine, it doesn't pass, you about through, this? Uh, pass through the um, blood-brain barrier, and it affects your blood pressure. It also plays a role in other bodily functions, including the immune system, circulatory system, respiratory, and urinary system. And, you know, everybody likes caffeine, and this is an important tie-in with adenosine. Caffeine it competes with adenosine. Caffeine is a stimulant, and it counteracts or undermines the impact of adenosine. And we know caffeine lasts in your system about six hours. So this is important. If you know you're an early bird chronotype, meaning you want to go to bed ideally at nine, back up six hours, you really shouldn't be drinking caffeine after three, or it's going to impact your sleep initiation, maintenance, and quality. So keep that's that's a big piece of this too we'll talk about in sleep hygiene and you know a lot of people say i'll just drink decaf and i'll just say that you know decaf is probably better than full caffeinated coffee but it still has a percentage depending on the brand of caffeine that's going to counteract the adenosine um, cycle and then some people say oh i can drink caffeine right up until i sleep and that may be true but your sleep architecture those stages and those uh, sleep cycles aren't going to be as good or as restorative or high quality. So, um, you know, don't uh, underestimate the impact that caffeine can have on your sleep and the sleep quality. So here's a good example of how that adenosine builds up throughout the day along with your circadian rhythm. And then it goes down when you sleep and then it builds up again. That's part of that 24-hour cycle that we are innately uh, born with. So now the dark side of sleep, we know through various many studies that even one night of sleep will impact negatively on any number of things, our cognition, our um, energy levels, our reaction rates, our reflexes, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are impacted even after one night of poor sleep. And poor sleep over time can lead to increased morbidity and increased mortality, especially when you associate it with higher rates of heart attacks, uh, inflammation, increased rates of stroke, increased rates of diabetes, 
increased obesity, increased blood pressure. There's even studies out there that show increased rates of dementia with poor sleep. And, you know, we just sprung forward with the clocks. Statistically speaking, in population studies, we see a spike in myocardial infarctions or heart attacks when we lose that hour. In the fall, when we gain an hour, those same heart attacks go down on a population scale. Pretty amazing stuff. Less than four hours really does a number on your immunity and you don't fight infection or disease as well. Uh, poor sleep also affects our microbiome in our gut, which is really important. It becomes off kilter and imbalance, which causes other concerns. We see decrease in memory and performance, like I said, only after one night. Uh, severe sleep deprivation is on par with alcohol use in terms of um, you know, car accidents and how it impairs your ability to drive and respond and react to things. And then, of course, again, I'm in psychiatry. With poor sleep chronically, we see increased rates of depression, increased rates of mania and bipolar spectrum disorder, increased anxiety, increased suicidal ideation, increased levels of psychosis and psychotic spectrum disorder. So there is a certainly a downside to sleep if you're not getting good restorative sleep. So now let's move into some really practical applications and things that you all might want to consider to help improve your sleep quality. And again, in my opinion, the foremost authority in our country for sleep and all things related to sleep is uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. This is their professional association, and they publish guidelines on various sleep issues. So their guideline on sleep is basically their insomnia guidelines, and they recommend a type of cognitive behavioral therapy as their first-line treatment for sleep way before pharmacology. There was a time where we probably used sleep aids too much. So this current guideline says you don't want to use meds first, use CBTI, which is a specific cognitive behavioral therapy for sleep. Um, and yeah, there are going to be some people that end up on sleep aids um, and will need that, but you want to try this first. And this cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia teaches people how to alter their thoughts at night, de-escalate their thoughts, and initiate sleep better. And the studies show that it's uh, as effective or more and safer than medication. And it's a lot about education, stimulus control, sleep restrict restriction therapy, meaning you're only really in your bed for sleep and, and you know, sexual reproduction. It also is a big on um, relaxation training, other counter arousal methods. And this isn't something you do forever or even a year. It's very time limited. We're only talking about four to eight sessions, typically guided by somebody trained in CBTI. So it's very uh, important, very effective. Next question is, well, where do I find CBTI? You certainly can call your insurance and see if there are any like panel providers that are credentialed or, or do CBTI, that would be ideal. If you can't find one there, we oftentimes give this um, pretty good website out that people um, subscribe to as therapists and counselors, Psychology Today. Just plug in CBTI in your area, your city, your state, and it'll give you a list of CBTI providers. If neither one of those work, most of us, I'm probably pretty sure, will have a cell phone. And why do I say that? Because there's an app that's free to everybody to use it's published by the uh, collaborative effort between the VA, Department of Defense, and Stanford University. It's, it's this app here called the CBTI app, and it's got like this crescent moon on it. And this is free to download, free to use for as long as you want. And it's basically guiding you through CBTI, and it's ideally done with a person, but you can do it as a standalone app too. And these are just some screenshots of what it's doing, kind of what I already described. I will tell you personally, my wife uh, was having trouble sleeping a couple years ago. I had her use this and she found it to be very effective and still utilizes some of this stuff uh, today. Um, not as much as she did back then, but you can kind of see the coaching that takes place, de-escalating with your quieting your mind, sleep diary, which is really important to kind of 
come up with some new insights on how you can enhance your sleep hygiene and improve it. So that's the CBTI app. So now we'll move to sleep hygiene, which is basically just like physical hygiene. It's good habits that we, uh, sleep habits that we term sleep hygiene. And these help people get a better night's sleep. And I, I've said this so many times to people and they'll shoot back at me. Oh, I know all that. That's all common sense. That's, I get that a lot. But I say, yeah, that's maybe common sense. You may know it, but a lot of people don't really practice it as much as they should because these studies show, studies are out there that prove that uh, in well-designed studies, these sleep hygiene practices are high yield and evidence-based to provide meaningful improvements in various things measured, whether it be a primary measure or a secondary measure. So do not underestimate how powerful some of these simple uh, but effective techniques can be. And here's kind of the basics, 12 basic things of sleep hygiene. I'm not going to go through every single one in the interest of time, but you can kind of see, you know, silent, dark room, sensory de-escalation. Um, probably the top three that I see kind of misused and abused in most of the people I work with would be this caffeine piece that counteracts adenosine. And using it way too long into the evening, because then that's going to affect initiation, like we said, in that adenosine sleep pressure. So that's probably, you know, number one. Number two is how inconsistent people are when they go to bed and wake up. The more consistent you are and the more that's synced up to your chronotype, the better it's going to be. So even on weekends when you want to sleep in and say, I'm going to catch up on a bunch of sleep, keep it to the same as weekdays, holidays. Sleep consisting is really important for sleep hygiene and quality. And third, probably no big surprise, is using screen time too late, You know, whether it be a phone, a tablet, a computer, a laptop. Um, you see that and it disrupts the circadian rhythm that um, sleep drive, sleep pressure from adenosine, melatonin, Etc. So people kind of balk at that and they're so used to it. If you're going to do it, um, use some blue light glasses that you can buy off of Amazon or wherever else. And as you can see, the different colors block out different percentages of blue light. And additionally, most of these devices, electronic devices, have a night filter on them that basically um, you switch over and it takes, it filters out the blue light. Um, some screen protectors also are blue light um, blockers too. But basically when you do this, it turns into more like fire uh, fireplace colors, you know, like yellows and reds are usually pretty good. So that's another kind of quick tip you could do if you, if you have to use your screen for some reason. Additionally, this is kind of an interesting one that I, I learned from my patients, probably about five patients in people would talk about these weighted blankets. And I was like, hmm, wonder if there's something here. So I started to look into it. And sure enough, there was and still is some emerging research that suggests that weighted blankets help with improving insomnia and sleep quality, specifically in certain areas like anxiety um, disorders, attention deficit disorders, autism spectrum, and other uh, sleep conditions. And um, the theory is behind this it's called deep pressure stimulation. You put weight on the thorax, that press puts pressure on the vagus nerve, which is parasympathetic, and it starts to slow and calm the body down from restlessness, anxieties, and improves overall sleep metrics through this deep pressure stimulation. And I don't know if anybody's come across this amazing woman. This is Temple Grandin. It's very... Uh, famous like um, animal behaviorist and she has autism spectrum disorder and she connects, you know, with animals and one of her relatives, uncle or something had a farm and she was watching cattle get vaccinated and they were really skittish. And then they put them in this um, uh, hug machine, they call it, and they squeeze the cattle and the cattle gets calm and it, calm enough that they can safely get inoculated with whatever vaccine they're giving. And she got to thinking, like, wonder if I could, you know, self-treat my own anxiety. So she went home, this is from her movie, and made her own hug machine with 
a kind of pulley system. And sure enough, it worked for her. It's turned into like different types of um, furniture for patients with autism, et cetera. Same kind of concept with pets and the thunder jackets with separation anxiety and storm anxiety. Same thing with swaddling of a baby. That's deep pressure stimulation, uh, which can be helped with weighted blankets. They range in weight, five to 30 pounds. You want to go to five to 10% of your body weight. What's nice is you can pretty much feel the effect immediately, like within a minute or so. So you don't have to wait a long time. There's just a few contraindications. You certainly don't want to give it to an infant. That would be dangerous. Anybody with like compromised breathing or anybody with claustrophobic, where it would be the opposite effect. This is what they look like if you've never seen them. Pretty much a regular blanket, but they are very heavy because in these pleats, they either have sand, leaded glass, or like really small lead beads. And here's a University of Pennsylvania study that, again, highlights those disorders that have the most evidence base behind them. I went on PubMed and found some other um, well-designed studies that show that it's appropriate for anxiety, possibly anxiety, maybe not enough in this study. Here's the other study that said it was good for sleep with major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, the ADHD again, and just improving daytime symptoms and level of activity. So there is data out there. Here's another kind of unique thing that's up and coming some in some circles. It's kind of a mouthful autonomous sensory meridian response. And this is where you, to a certain sound frequency, you start to experience like a physical sensa sensation and relaxing, tingling sensation in the back of your head there. And it spreads down your neck into the spine and causes this calming effect. And it's different for everybody. Like we said, everybody's got different chronotypes, genes, variables with sleep. Some people respond to this more than others. And there's a whole like little world of YouTube videos, different frequency, different sounds that people use to help get them to sleep. So, and that's been kind of emerging ever since about 2010. And this is kind of a graph of the sensation. It's kind of usually starts and it just moves down. It's kind of a weird feeling at first if you've never experienced it. And you know, this is still kind of early, but there's enough out there that I would say this is evidence informed. Um, it's probably not going to show up in any like uh, American Association of Sleep Medicine guidelines, but it's out there enough that show that it helps people relax and induce sleep. So here's some of the PEB mud studies that I uh, found on it showing that it can improve mood and reduce arousal, uh, alleviating symptoms of insomnia and depression in this one study. Another study uh, here says that, oh, it actually got compared with classical music and ASMR. And the ASMR actually involved more complex brain function than classical music alone, which is kind of interesting because there's something else going on with that nervous system response. And this is all throughout the world. You see different rates, different countries. Europe is, as they say, it's bigger in Europe than it is here. And certain countries have different rates of people who are kind of using this. I'll forewarn you, if you put in ASMR videos for sleep, you get some weird stuff out there, but I tend to focus more on the, the frequency that I respond to most. And this is actually what I personally respond to, 528, which is kind of a whole body repair. But somebody else on this call may respond to 741 or, or some other, kind of give it some you know trial and error and see what works best for you, if at all. So lots of YouTube videos on that. And finally, as we wrap up this section, just uh, gonna hit a high, a couple things here. Exercising tends to really help with sleep. There used to be this myth that you really shouldn't um, exercise too late, but that's been kind of proven wrong. Cooler temperature, the better, like 62 to 68. Hot bath, shower, it helps dilate the vessels and you get into bed and it helps cool. Essential oils, specifically lavender oil in these diffusers. Uh, if you're a light sleeper, sleep masks, earplugs. Sleep divorce is when you have a partner that is restless, snores, or a pet that kind of wakes you up all the time. You basically separate yourself in a different room, different bed, on the couch, etc. 
um, meditation, a lot of apps out there for that. Breathing work, mindfulness, stretching, journaling, all good stuff. Medication, um, gonna watch my time here. I usually say the best sleep is naturally occurring and better without medications. Again, there are exceptions, even my patient population, we, we use it in. I will adv advise against staying away from antihistamines like um, diphenhydramine, Benadryl, and everything contained in it, like Sequel, Tylenol PM. Unisom is just another version of a first-generation antihistamine. And they have a lot of side effects, and over time, probably more uh, bad than good with that. So if you're ever concerned if a medication has an antihistamine in it, just ask your doctor or pharmacist. Uh, melatonin, I'm a big proponent of melatonin. It's a naturally occurring thing. As we age, sometimes we produce less melatonin, so supplementing it can be helpful. There's other data out there for other over-the-counter supplements, as you can see here. Magnesium glycinate or threonine, not necessarily the citrate. That's more for bodily uh, concerns. Ashwagandha, L-theanine. Actographs, I kind of like this. Um, I realized my smartwatch... Uh, did uh, sleep tracking, and there's studies that say it's pretty effective. And um, there's sleep watches, Fitbits, actographs. There's rings called an aura ring, I think, that say it's pretty accurate, not up there with a the sleep lab, but not too bad. And this is actually a version of my watch, and it basically tells you what I'm telling you here, how many sleep cycles I got how long in various stages. And that's all from a watch. So it's kind of nice to get objective measures and it gives you a number. So on this, when I was prepping this talk, March 20th, I got a 92, so not too bad. Now we're gonna shift gears to the fatigue side of thing. And this is the other side of the coin sometimes. It isn't always because you're not sleeping well. It can be for other reasons as we'll see. And it has to do with energy. And I'm thinking, you know, what's energy? So I went to the dictionary. It's the strength and vitality required for sustained physical activity, which, again, is a little ambiguous, hard to understand. In reality, that comes to, it allows us to be who we are and do what we want to do. So for me, I want to wake up, take care of myself, prep food, eat food, take care of my pet, work, go to school, exercise, take care of myself and loved ones. That all requires energy and a level of fatigue that I want to not have. And that's what makes us us and you know, our quality of life. So this is sort of like everybody sleeps bad sometimes. Everybody gets fatigued sometimes. They'll describe it different ways. So you can kind of ask more specifically what exactly they're feeling. Some people have trouble defining what fatigue is to them. So the more you can kind of tease that out, the better. And believe it or not, it's the, one of the top five concerns brought to their primary care providers. So that's how common it is. So it's not that surprising that it was number one on the list for this talk tonight. And a lot of economic implications, not only in our country, but throughout the world, as you see, high cost to companies, countries, society, in terms of lost work, performance, creativity, safety concerns, whether it be on a factory line or on the road. Um, and it just impacts our ability to perform daily activities, our quality of life, our well-being. It makes us concentrate less, probably isolate ourselves more, be more irritable, moody, etc. So anything we can do to help with this is high yield as well, as is the sleep piece. And it's subjective, self-recognized, I will tell you it can be acute, uh, short, quick, short-acting, or long-term uh, chronic. And it's associated with a variety of physical or psychological conditions. And that's the other thing I try to tease out. Is this more physical? Is it more cognitive or more psychological from a psychiatric disorder? And here's just a, you know, a smattering of causes. I will just point out prolonged activity. You overdo it. Or conversely, you don't do enough activity, you decondition, and then you become fatigued when you try to do something. A lot of times it's multifactorial, that last block there. Trait fatigue is usually when it's more chronic and it's associated with the disease. A lot of studies out there show that cancer fatigue is super common, stroke fatigue, 
MS, big issues. I pulled out schizophrenia as it applies to this group here. Uh, that can be a, a negative symptom trait fatigue with schizophrenia. As you can see here in this study, they attribute it uh, to the negative side of anhedonia. So here's another kind of non-exhaustive list of sources of fatigue. So as we look at our practical recommendations here, the first thing that I like to tell patients is, or people I work with, starters recognizes this is real. It isn't you being weak or lazy or whatnot. You need to be kind to yourself, give yourself grace. Along those lines, explain to your family, friends, colleagues that, hey, I've got fatigue because of X, Y, or Z. And that by itself can help you relax a little bit. You don't have to cover, compensate, and always be worried that somebody's going to be thinking something bad about you. Fatigue's invisible, and you really need to kind of say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. And people understand it more than you think. And I've been in medicine 25 years, and I still think people are very understanding uh, of this if you tell them. So that's step number one. Step number two is much like we saw with the um, uh, CBTI and the, the sleep diary. Same kind of thing when it comes to fatigue. Do an activity log, an energy log for at least a week, because I can almost guarantee if you do it, you're going to find out new insights in more effective ways to manage your fatigue and strategies. And um, so that's a really key point here. Helps make you be better, uh, make better choices about what you do and don't. You can go online. This is one I snagged from a chronic fatigue website. It's probably a little bit more complicated than I'm used to or it needs to be. So I kind of just made this one up for this talk. And as you can see here, if somebody brought this to me and we looked at a week's worth, we might see, uh, you know, they start out good because they slept well. And then throughout the day, they get really fatigued after the gym and they're trying to study. And if I looked at this activity log, I'd say, you know, there's probably a better time to study. You move it, move it up here or a little bit back when you're less fatigued. And that's, again, the beauty of this that can be picked up only through, you know, journaling and logging. And you're wanting to avoid this boom or bust doing too much when you have energy, and then you crash and pay for it. You do that too often, you see a decline across the board to what you can even do and how much longer it's taking to recover. So your trajectory is down. What you want to do is that straight, static, horizontal line, which indicates pacing. So here's another. You want to stay on the purple line and not go too high or too low, or that's contributing to the long-term boom or bust phenomenon, which is really common in a lot of the conditions I come across. Some people liken it to their cell phone battery and being able to adjust it accordingly. So that may be a mindset you can use. Uh, real quick, I just, uh, in the interest of time, I in the study that I was doing research, interestingly, in the Olympics and world records, there's specifically a time, late afternoon, early evening, where most of the records are um, broken because you're at peak performance. So sometimes you can factor that in to what you want to do in terms of, you know, cut the lawn or do laundry or whatever. And another big thing with fatigue management is the three P's, pretty self-explanatory pacing, avoiding that boom or bust, planning out, when am I going to do things better? When am I best to study? It's not after gym, it's probably earlier or later. And prioritizing, when do I need to do things? Can I space it out? As you can see here, pretty much what I just went over, and it's it's that classic you want to you know work smarter, not harder. And you know we hit the uh, three pillars now. We included exercise with a way to help with sleep, and nutrition's really important when it comes to fatigue and energy. And there's this thing called the Rainbow Diet, which reduces inflammation and overall fatigue and improves energy. And that's pretty self-explanatory, too. That's just eating uh, colorful foods, which tend to be fruits and vegetables. And it increases your immune system, increases your energy. And I'm pretty close to Ohio State. This is a study that came out last year. Uh, again, fatigue's big in cancer. So this rainbow diet helped with cancer fatigue. And it basically says at the end, it can just improve fatigue overall. 
So high yield stuff there too. And here's the third pillar that I mentioned, light exercise. We don't want you to overdo it and boom, but enough to kind of improve things. Behavioral activation is just kind of keeping your momentum going. You produce endorphins and kaplins, the feel-good hormones of the body. Relaxation techniques, mindfulness, we'll talk about in the next slide real quick. Delegate. Here's that part about working smarter, not harder. In this day and age, you can you can have people shop for it. You can have companies or places make a whole week's worth of meals for you, you know, to kind of help pace things out, plan things, prioritize a little bit better, and just adapt to your energy level. Here's the big difference between mindful on your left and mindful, which is where we want to be to kind of help with managing fatigue and energy. Here's another way to, to visualize it. Um, the girl on my left, too much stuff worrying about all sorts of things versus the lady kind of being in the present and being very mindful. She's going to be more restful and better. And this is another thing I would encourage you to look up. It's called the 30 second drop anchor. And it's a mindfulness technique that you can do any place, anywhere. People don't even know you're doing it. And it's really effective to kind of help you with this mindful state. So finishing up here, but you know, when you might want to get concerned and talk to your doctor about, hey, my fatigue's getting worse, not better. If you implement all this and it's getting worse, that you probably need some further investigation. I'd give it about three to six months. And, you know, talk to your doctor. They're going to do a more intense physical exam, rule things in, rule things out. If labs are warranted, they'll get them and proceed accordingly. So that that's just a kind of a just-in-case slide. So as we wrap up and maybe take some questions here, like I said earlier, sleep is just taken for granted sometimes. And there's still some mysteries out there that are yet to be solved. But we do know, and hopefully I've impressed upon you. Sleep is really important to healthy brain function, performance, our moods, our, our overall physical and mental health. Not getting enough sleep raises the risk of other disease or worsening your, your current disorder disease. There's more to good sleep than just getting seven, eight, nine hours. It's that quality, that architecture, that hypnogram that I showed you. And there's a lot of things you can do to kind of improve your sleep tonight, tomorrow, the next night. CBTI, sleep hygiene practices, those 12 things, weighted blankets, ASMR, and the other things we showed you. And lastly, fatigue is another common symptom of everyday life that we all kind of deal with from time to time. And it causes other you know, things. It's multifactorial a lot of times. That activity uh, fatigue log is really important to kind of develop new techniques and strategies. So that's the three P's, the rainbow diet, and other things like mindfulness techniques. And, you know, a lot of people want that quick, immediate satisfaction thing, magic fix. And I don't have that. I don't think that's out there. Uh, sticking to evidence-based or evidence-informed practices like the ones we went over tonight are really, I think, in layering those to the best of your ability is really the best path forward to helping both of these concerns we talked about tonight and improving your overall health and well-being. And that's kind of uh, how we'll wrap up. So, um, yeah, so we'll certainly open it up to a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rush, for this very enlightening lecture. You answered so many of my questions. Is it easy to find a therapist who does the CBTI? Yeah, great question. I wish it was easier than it is. I'm in Columbus, pretty big metropolitan area. Uh, the VA has some. Uh, we've got one or two counselors within this large system that I'm in. And when I plugged it into psychology today, not too long ago, I think I hit about five. So that's where it's not as common as it could be or should be. And that's where that CBTI app comes into play to kind of supplement a question in the chat. I think I'll go ahead and just read it for us. It's from Chelsea. Do you know if saccades, I believe, which are involved with our visual auditory vestibular systems are related to the rapid eye movements? She says, I wonder because when we sleep, the regions of the brain actively involved with what we are dreaming about are active when we dream. We'll ask that question first and then she asks another one. 
Yeah, I boy, that's a good one. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I know that saccades are mentioned a lot uh, in different types of mental illness, even, but I don't know how that um, how that correlates with rapid eye movement. There are some similarities there, granted, Chelsea, but I don't know if I know anything specific to answer on that one. Let's take her other question too. It says, another question I have is that I have a ton of nightmares and I tend to wake up with a lot of anxiety. Once I wake up, it takes me a few minutes for my anxiety to go down. Does that have to do with cortisol levels? It's a bit complicated there. Yeah, cortisol levels is um, known. It, it's another cyclical thing. So we do think cortisol uh, probably plays a role in nightmare um, production and continuation. So anything you can do to decrease those levels of cortisol, typically the de-arousal techniques that we talked about, the mindfulness, the calming techniques should help with that. We didn't get into nightmares too much, but one thing, a really promising type of therapy that I'll um, I'll throw out there for Chelsea is it's called image rehearsal therapy. And it's showing some really promise to um, help with nightmares. So image rehearsal therapy, and much like the smartwatches, actographs, rings, there is a device now that also is out there for nightmares called um, Nightwear. That's using a watch as well. So those are some non-pharmacological techniques Again, won't get into the weeds too much with pharmacology, but there's also a kind of an up and coming uh, medication oftentimes used for um, nightmares that don't respond to non-pharmacological measures. It's called prezosin, and it's an alpha uh, alpha uh, medication, which is the um, it has to do with norepinephrine and cortisol and those excitatory types of things that drops that down. So that would be another thing that I would consider for nightmares. Prezosin. All right. We do have we do have a few more minutes. So let's just sure. keep going and see how many yeah, let's keep we going. can get. Susan says people take antihistamines every day for allergies. So why is it bad to take every day for sleep? Yeah, good question. Great question, actually. So the antihistamines that I was referring to that I would say would be avoided uh, avoiding that's your diphenhydramine and your doxylamine. Those are what we call first-generation antihistamines, and they go into the brain. So those typically have the negative consequences that I told you about that I was worried about, the uh, cognitive dulling, the tachyphylaxis and things. The newer generation antihistamines um, like cetirizine, loratadine, some of these others, they are called second-generation antihistamines, and they don't enter into the brain. So they're not bad. So thank you for clarifying that. When I said avoid antihistamines, I meant the first generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine um, and doxylamine. The second generation, newer generation, the stuff you take during the day, that's why you can take it in the day because they're not sedating. They're not going into the brain and creating the central nervous system suppression or depression. So hopefully that answers your question. But, you know, the... The brand names of that would be like your Claritins, your Zyrtex, things like that. And that's not the ones I'm talking about avoiding. Okay, let's keep going. I often sleep just a few hours. This is from Leaf. Wake up and have a hard time getting back to sleep. In total, I often sleep more than 10 to 12 hours, but rarely all at the same time. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, it's always tough to just blanket state. And so I want to talk more specifically about that. But hey, let's go upstream. What is it that's waking you up? You know, is it the caffeine use? Is it hydrating too much beforehand and having to go to the bathroom? Are you a light sleeper? I would go upstream and say, you know, what is it that keeps waking you up? Is it pain? I mean, it can be any number of things. But um, I think trying to find the cause of what's waking you up. And going upstream and and treating accordingly would be my best uh, advice there. Hey, how can I promote increased adenosine release into the body? Yeah, so um, that's a good one too. That's um, that's something you don't have a lot of control over, but that's just kind of 
making sure you're not counteracting it as much by excessive caffeine and excess in caffeine too late in the day. Adenosine is going to happen regardless. Um, so just allowing that to happen and using good sleep medicine. So by the time it's at its peak, that sleep pressure, you're going to be able to go to sleep uh, at that time. So uh, avoiding caffeine is probably the best thing you have control over to keep your adenosine where it needs to be. And it is, um, you know, created from your diet. So a healthy diet would also be the other part of that, a balanced, nutritious diet. We have a couple more minutes, so let's keep going. Okay. Someone says, I find myself getting drained and talking with some people. I find it hard to identify why I get so fatigued. Any ideas? Ooh, that's one of these interpersonal questions. You know, there, um, I would, you know, want to know, is it everybody across the board, certain people um, that are draining you? I would probably on that one, I'd probably gear more towards that mindfulness strategy that we talked about to clear your mind. Sometimes they'll project things onto you and you start feeling the same things they are in terms of anxiety, inner stress, turmoil. And you can kind of start thinking that even subconsciously. So clearing your mind and being mindful using that 30 second drop anchor technique, see if that would help. Um, you know, if you have a therapist talking to your therapist about why certain people drain you more than others, you know, is it, is it everybody or just certain people? We'll take one more before we close. Uh, sure. She says, my loved one takes clothes of pain, which makes him sleepy. And he sleeps about 10 to 12 hours each day. Most of the dosage is taken at bedtime. I've been told this helps his brain heal, but also causes weight gain. Is this just something to live with when you take clozapine? Yeah, clozapine can be um, a sedating medication. And that's why we do try to consolidate it to the majority of the dose at night. Sometimes we'll give it entirely at night. So you take your 200 at night, your 300 at night. Um, so that would be ideal if that works for that person. Um, and, you know, hopefully over time, you can sometimes adjust the sedating properties of medication. You can still potentially counteract some of that sedating properties with um, proper energy during the day and fatigue mitigation strategies like we talked about. But clozapine is, is one of our best medications out there. I mean, we love clozapine for uh, regular psychosis, treatment resistant. It's that good. So sometimes you have to deal with some degree of side effects to get the immense benefit with clozapine. So there is a little bit of um, compromise there. But I mean, clozapine is so good. If if you have to deal with a little sedation or extra sleep, to me, that's worth it in terms of symptom management, staying healthy, staying out of the hospital, staying out of the next episode of psychosis. Okay, we will close it this time. It's 710. Thank you again so much, Dr. Rush. If anybody My has time. any follow-up questions that we didn't get to tonight, please just email me and I will get back to you. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Take thanks, care everyone. Thanks, night. Bethany. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.